Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to you all to St John's Chambers' second webinar in the current series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Beth King Smith, and I'm a partner at Harrison Clark Wikipedia, and I'm delighted that St John's asked me to co-host this with them today. I've got a few points of housekeeping just to attend to first. We have got four speakers today, which hopefully you will have noticed if you've read the schedule. Um, we will ask you please to make questions in the Q&A box, which you should find on the right hand side. If you can ask the questions as we go on that in that box, we can start collating them and then we will pick up all questions at the end. The second point to note, obviously, is that today is Armistice Day and so um, out of respect, we will be taking a two minute silence at 11 a.m. Uh, and hopefully Michael Clark, who will be speaking then, will be able to wrap up in time for that. And then we will come back to continue if he has not been able to finish his part and obviously for questions. So without further ado, I think that's all from me. And um, for any of you who are uh, concerned that this might be uh, replicating Chief Master Marsh's talk, if you saw that on Monday with the ACT APS group, you'll be pleased to know we have got a whole range of very engaging contentious trust and probate matters, none of them which involve removal of executors. So I will pass over now to our first speaker, that's Daniel Saul. Thank you and enjoy. Thanks, Beth. Um, well, I know um, the prospect of going through the non-contentious probate rules is what you all got out of bed for this morning. So without further ado, uh, I'll continue with caveats and how to deal with them. Uh, I know many of you be familiar uh, with the process, um, but I'm just going to cover it briefly and some of the uh, some of the aspects. Um, right, I've got control of my slides. Great. So just to cover off the sources first, the, the procedure can be found in Rule 44 of the, the non-contentious probate rules. Um, as you can see, those rules have been around for a little while now. Uh, 1987, they came into force. Uh, a new set of draft rules were published in 2013, but they're not come into force yet. Uh, they were out for consultation. Uh, no major amendments uh, were made in those rules. Some amendments uh, that were suggested in those rules were implemented in 2018, such as uh, a change in some of the time limits, uh, for example, for entering an appearance. Uh, but I've incorporated those changes into uh, this talk today. Uh, it should be noted if you do use the legislation.gov website, uh, the non contentious probate rules on there, um, they're, they're the original rules. They haven't included the, the amendments uh, in 2018, so do watch out for that. One of the changes that may be coming if the 2013 probate rules were implemented is simply a change in terminology. Uh, so, for example, uh, the term citation will change to notification and caveat will change to objection. Um, that's just uh, supposed to make it a little bit more accessible. So what is a caveat? Well, it's simply a notice um, issued by a person and filed at a probate registry. Uh, which prevents the grant of a uh, prevents the issue of a grant of probate in the estate of the deceased named in the notice. Once that notice has been uh, entered, then no grant of probate will issue except to the caveat or unless and until the caveat has been removed or it expires. So why enter a caveat? Well, generally it gives you a bit of breathing space if you've been uh, instructed uh, in a potential claim or challenge against the will, uh, then it gives you a bit of time to investigate that claim to see whether it has uh, any prospects. Um, for example, I was instructed on something recently uh, where there were some suspicious circumstances around the execution of the will uh, and there was some doubt as to the testator's capacity when the will was executed. Uh, and so entering a caveat there simply provides a bit of time uh, to try and get hold of the medical records and to uh, perhaps get hold of the will file and do some investigation, see whether there's a claim. Uh, and then the caveat can either be withdrawn or uh, you can proceed to, towards a probate claim. Uh, just to note, it shouldn't generally be used in, in 75 Act claims, um, but you may have a case where you have a number of claims on the table, potentially a will challenge as well as a 75 Act claim. 
And if you are uh, considering a will challenge, then a caveat still uh, can be appropriate in those circumstances. Uh, who can enter a caveat? Well, anyone who has an interest or asserts an interest in the estate uh, can lodge a caveat and it remains in force for six months. It can be renewed and it can be repeatedly renewed. Um, so if, if you need further time, uh, then that can uh, be an option. The fee is £20 a pop, so it's not going to break the bank. Uh, it does have to be paid every time you renew it. Uh, so watch out for that. Uh, but it can also be withdrawn at any point uh, until an appearance is entered and we'll move on to appearances a bit later. But just to note that if you get to a point where you think actually uh, we don't have a good claim here or if the opposition to the grant of probate uh, ceases, uh, then the, the caveat can simply be withdrawn. The caveat is entered either at the principal registry or any district probate registry uh, and the form looks like this. I've taken this from Tristan and Coote's probate practice. Uh, you can see here, and one thing to note is that you really don't have to provide much information when you enter a caveat. You simply need uh, the name and address or last address of the deceased and the date of death and to provide your own name and address. Um, now, once the registry receives a caveat, it enters it on their online index against the name and address of the deceased so that when someone applies for a grant, uh, the, the registry will do a search of the index and if there's no caveat on that name and address, uh, then they'll issue the grant. So just one thing to note is that it can be useful to enter um, any alternative names that the deceased used or, or addresses uh, just to ensure that they're entered in the index uh, and won't, a grant won't be obtained by uh, someone applying for the grant in, in a slightly different name of the deceased. Uh, so it's just that's just something to watch out for. So what do you do if uh, you are seeking to obtain a grant, but you're told by the registry that there's a caveat in place? Well, the thing to do is to issue what's called a warning. And in the warning, uh, it's another document that you set out uh, what your uh, interest in the estate is and why you're entitled to that grant of probate. Uh, and then you serve that on the caveat or, and that gives them 14 days to take some action if they don't want the caveat to be removed. Now, this is what a warning looks like. As you can see, uh, it sets out at the bottom there, um, it sets out the name and address of the person warning and their interest in the estate. And uh, above you have the warning, which says you have 14 days uh, starting on the day which this warning was served on you. Now you either enter an appearance if you have got a contrary interest in the estate, uh, but another reason you might want to uh, lodge a caveat is not if you have an interest in the estate, but if you uh, consider the person applying for the grant of probate to be the wrong person, um, then you can also lodge a caveat. Uh, but if that is the case, uh, then you, you shouldn't enter an appearance. You should actually serve a summons uh, to get directions from a district judge or a registrar. So once you've received the warning, if you're a caveat or you then have 14 days, so you don't have long uh, and you have to enter an appearance or uh, or issue a summons for directions. If no action is taken, if no appearance or uh, summons is served, then the caveat or after the fourth, uh, then the, the person entering the warning, sorry, after the 14 days has expired, uh, can then lodge a caveat with the Leeds District Probate Registry. That's the, the nominated probate registry uh, for this procedure. Uh, they lodge an affidavit and you basically say, uh, simply set out that the warning was duly served. The fee for that is, is £11, so again, uh, it, it's an affordable process uh, and the registry will then run checks uh, on, on its index to check that no appearance has been entered and if everything's been done right and the caveat is simply removed and you can continue uh, to obtain your grant as usual. However, if an appearance is entered, uh, it's, it's a fairly serious step because court involvement then becomes inevitable. Uh, you essentially need a court order to remove the caveat once an appearance has been entered. Uh, even if uh, the parties consent, uh, the caveat can no longer simply be removed uh, by the caveat or uh, you still need uh, an order of the court, uh, which can be uh, made on summons. Uh, so you don't need to issue a contentious probate claim if there's consent. Uh, but otherwise, the only real 
uh, way forward to remove the caveat is to issue a contentious probate claim. Again, the appearance is simply another form, which I'll show you in a second. You must have to enter an appearance an interest contrary to that of the person who issued the warning. And you must state it in the appearance. Uh, so at, at this point, uh, once the appearance has been served, uh, both parties will know what the other's interest uh, is being claimed in, in the deceased estate. So that's quite an important function of the appearance. Uh, and the appearance, once you've had it sealed, must be served on the person who is warning the caveat. This is what the appearance looks like. Uh, again, fairly uh, similar to what we've seen before, uh, apart from at the bottom, the caveat or has to set out finally their interest in the estate, which hasn't been disclosed thus far uh, in the caveat. So that's uh, an important feature of the appearance. So once uh, both parties are armed with that information, it's open to either of them to issue the contentious probate claim. Uh, and just to note that, that because uh, entering an appearance makes court involvement inevitable, there is some cost risk there. Uh, so it's not to be done lightly uh, because once the probate claim uh, is issued and a decision has been made, obviously the loser is going to be uh, probably liable for the, for the winner's legal costs. And if you've entered an appearance inappropriately, uh, then you're likely to be punished for that. So in summary, a uh, caveat can be entered uh, by anyone who has an interest in the estate. It lasts for six months, but can be renewed. Uh, a caveat can be warned off by the person seeking to obtain the grant. And if uh, they do so, then the caveator has uh, a strict 14 day uh, period within which to make an appearance or uh, issue an, uh, issue a summons for directions and once the appearance has been lodged then uh, no grant uh, can be made without an order of the court so that really makes a contentious probate claim uh, rather inevitable at that point if no agreement can be reached. Uh, I should just note that if um, if you are seeking to administer the estate and there's something urgent that comes up that needs to be dealt with uh, before a, the, the contentious probate proceedings uh, are finished, uh, then a limited grant can be taken out in certain circumstances. I won't go into that now, uh, but a, a limited grant in order to collect and protect the estate uh, can be obtained in circum certain circumstances. There's two different procedures depending on whether uh, proceedings have been issued at that point, uh, but still no distribution of the estate can be made. So uh, I'll leave that there, Beth. Um, thanks and thanks for listening, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, just clicking through. Uh, I'm Josh Knight. I'm going to be talking about litigation friends today. Uh, in particular, uh, when you should be applying to be a litigation friend, how to apply, how to correct mistakes if it goes wrong, uh, what evidence is required uh, for such an appointment. Uh, and I'm going to be concentrating in particular on the case of Hinduja and Hinduja, a decision of the High Court. Uh, this summer. I'm going to start look by looking at the case for litigation friends for defendants and specifically how you're able to be appointed uh, without the need uh, for a court order. If you're a deputy, uh, you can do that by filing a copy of this, uh, the COP order. That's 21.5 of the CPR. Uh, for anyone else who wants to act on behalf of a defendant, you file a certificate of suitability uh, and that comes in prescribed form, the N2355, uh, N235 rather. Um, in either case, uh, you need to satisfy the criteria in, in 2143, and that is twofold. Firstly, that you can fairly and competently conduct proceedings on behalf of the child or the protected party. Uh, and secondly, uh, that you don't have an interest adverse to that child or protected party. Um, when do you need to do this? Well, in both cases, it must be done at the time when he, i.e. the applicant, first takes a step in the proceedings on behalf of the defendant. Now, it's important to note that that might be uh, the filing of uh, the defence or the acknowledgement of service, but equally it could come later. Um, if uh, 
the part the defendant loses capacity during proceedings, uh, then obviously it is is going to be whichever stage that happens and whichever stage you as the litigation friend want to take over. Uh, the situation is different for claimants. Um, paragraph three of 21.5 says you must file the same certificate of suitability. You must satisfy the conditions in 21.43. So that's fairly incompetent in the act. No interest adverse. There's also a third criterion if you're the claimant, which as well as being competent and no adverse uh, interests, you must undertake to pay any costs which the child or protected party may be ordered to pay. But the crucial difference and, and where the claimant went wrong in Hinduja is 2153A, which states that you must file your N235 at the time when the claim is made. Um, so that is your only route uh, to being able to be appointed uh, without a court order. So that takes us on to Hinduja. And if you're the type of lawyer who can't help but sometimes feel an iota of schadenfreude when you come across other lawyers getting things wrong, don't worry, you're not alone. And secondly, this is very much the case for you. Um, first, a bit of backstory. Uh, even those of you who don't know this case, the name Hinduja might be familiar. Uh, they are four brothers who own a number of uh, businesses. They're of uh, Indian origin. Two of the brothers, Sri Sand and Gopchand, moved to the UK in, in the 1970s. They're UK citizens and they regularly top the UK rich list and, and did so last year. The third brother, Prakash, is based in Geneva and the fourth, uh, um, Ashok, oversees the Indian operations. Uh, Sri, uh, who's the eldest, based in the UK, uh, is the uh, patriarch, as described by the judge in this case, um, and leads the family business, or, or did uh, for some time. Anyway, in July 2014, all four brothers signed uh, two documents. The first of those documents sought to appoint each other as each other's executors, uh, and recorded that any asset owned by one was owned by all four brothers, so quite an unusual state of affairs. And, and the second document said that Gopi, Prakash and Ashok, the three younger brothers, uh, had authority to take any steps to carry these things into effect. Uh, Srisan, the eldest brother, um, brought this claim last November uh, against his three brothers, and he argued that this document uh, signed in July 2014 had no effect. Uh, whether as a will, a declaration of trust, a power of attorney, or, or otherwise. Um, or alternatively, he said that it was revocable and, and had indeed been revoked. Now, Hinduja is a useful uh, case for answering three questions, even though it's a first instance case and it's an interim decision. Um, but it's helpful in deciding what is the available remedy if you apply to be appointed as a litigation friend for the claimant um, at the same time as serving the claim form. Secondly, what medical evidence is essential for any application? And thirdly, in what circumstances will having a personal interest in the outcome of proceedings render you inappropriate to act as a litigation friend? The claim in this instance was brought um, on behalf of uh, Sri's daughter, uh, on Sri's behalf by his daughter, Vinu. Uh, she was represented uh, by Clifford Chance, uh, who had instructed two silks and two juniors uh, to act on their behalf. Somehow, between the, uh, those, or, or the lot of them, they failed to recognise that if they wanted a Vinu to act as a litigation friend, they were going to need to file that statement of suitability, that N235, at the same time uh, as issuing their claim in November. Uh, in fact, they didn't realise they'd failed to do this for over a month. Um, in December, they on, uh, on the 10th of December, they filed the N235 late, uh, and then they made an application the following day. And that application was styled under 2134, which is the top of the slide there, saying any step taken before a child uh, or protected party has a litigation friend has no effect 
unless the court orders otherwise. So they ask the court uh, to order otherwise. Um, and they sought confirmation as well uh, that the filing of the N235 had cured the defect um, of failing to file it in the first place and that accordingly Venu had been appointed under 21.5. Four months later, that, this legal team had another think and issued a second application, saying that if their first application wasn't successful, um, then they sought relief under CPR 310, um, or alternatively, they made a formal application uh, to be appointed by the court as, lit as a uh, Sri's litigation friend under CPR 21.6. CPR 310B uh, says the court may make an order to remedy an error uh, of uh, failure to comply with a rule or practice direction. And 21.6 is the route uh, to apply as litigation friend um, with a court order. Now, uh, under 21.6, again, they've got to meet the criteria that they uh, can fairly and competently act, that they've got no adverse interest and an undertaking uh, to pay costs. Now, what this ruling in Hinduja and Hinduja is useful for is emphasising the strictness of 21.5. The only way to be appointed uh, without a court order is to file your N235 at the same time as issuing the claim. Language in that section is unequivocal. So making an application, as they did in this case, under 21.34 to re retrospectively validate the error and argue that the N235 can be cured if fi filed late, um, isn't going to cut it. A court order is going to be required. And that leaves uh, 310B or 21.6. And the court chose the latter. In, in fact, the judge declined to say whether he considered it appropriate uh, for 310B to be applied in these circumstances. So the real takeaway point from this all is make sure you file your N235 with your claim form. If you don't, apply to be appointed under 21.6. And at the same time, you've got to apply to validate the previous step under 21.34, because if you don't, then the issuing of the claim form will have no effect and you're going to have to start again. I should point out, of course, the judge in this case was amenable um, to the application being made and valid, and he, he thought that it naturally followed uh, from approving that application uh, that he should validate the previous step. So all was not lost uh, for the claimants in that case. Uh, but the defendants argued uh, that the application should be rejected in any event, and it did so for two reasons. Firstly, Venu hadn't demonstrated that she was suitable uh, to act as a litigation friend. And secondly, she hadn't proved that a litigation friend wasn't in fact required because she hadn't produced any medical evidence and there had been no consideration of the test of capacity under Section 3 of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, on the question of medical evidence, it seems persuasive that this uh, should be produced in, in pretty much every case, um, not least because uh, capacity is assumed uh, unless it is proved, proven to the contrary. However, the practice direction at 20, of 21 is, is quite equivocal on this question. Uh, in relation to uh, applications using the certificate of suitability I, at the same time as you're issuing the claim. It says that a capacity report should be included if relied upon uh, when filing the certificate, which seems fairly obvious. However, no reference is made um, if it, in the part of the practice direction that deals uh, with an application to a court for appointment. It simply says that the application should be supported by evidence. Now, in Masterman and Lister and Bruton, Masterman, Lister and Bruton, which the defendants relied on in Hinduja, uh, the court said that medical evidence was going to be required um, when the court considered an application in almost every case. And this was reiterated in Folks and Fazy. The court pointed out it wasn't going to act as a rubber stamp and there was going to have to be uh, an extremely good reason as to uh, why there wasn't medical evidence 
uh, being put forward. However, in Hinduja, uh, the court was satisfied that it was able uh, to make the appointment without seeing medical evidence uh, about Sri's capacity. And it had a number of reasons uh, for saying this. Uh, firstly, it had the evidence of Finu herself, who lived with and cared for her father. And her, her evidence was that her father was unable to give instructions to his lawyers. We also had evidence from uh, Sri's wife, Finu's mother, who lived uh, with Finu and Sri uh, to similar effect. Uh, thirdly, uh, Vinu had Clifford Chance acting on her behalf, who had previously uh, been acting for Sri and in fact had been instructed on this matter by Sri uh, some years earlier, albeit he'd never got round to issuing proceedings. And perhaps crucially in this case, the defendants who were arguing uh, that the lack of capacity had not been proven were themselves arguing in separate Swiss proceedings that Sri didn't have capacity. Uh, so it was somewhat difficult for them to take the contrary view uh, within these proceedings. Importantly, the judge specifically rejected the assertion that each of the tests under section three of the MCA needed to be considered. It was enough to be, it was enough that Sri was unable to in instruct his lawyers uh, for the court to safely con conclude that Sri uh, was unable uh, to give uh, to conduct litigation. Uh, finally, uh, and, and relevantly for the, the times we live in, the court said, well, it, it, it's not exactly straightforward getting medical evidence in the middle of a pandemic. So what's the take out from all this? Well, it seems to me that Marsman, Lister and Bruton and, and folks in Fazy still stand. It is going to be the exceptional case rather than the rule in which the court allows uh, the appointment of a litigation friend upon a court application uh, without seeing some medical evidence. However, in some cases, the court will do so. This was one case, um, perhaps in other cases where it's, it's simply blindingly obvious that the individual in question doesn't have capacity, that going away and getting a capacity report simply isn't necessary, uh, would be an, another. Um, but the defendants in this case had a final argument up their sleeve, which was that Vinu was simply the wrong person uh, to act as a litigation friend. Uh, and the reason for that was that there was a conflict. Um, she stood to be the big gainer in all this if the claim succeeded. Her father was fabulously wealthy, old and infirm. Um, he didn't need to fight this claim. He certainly didn't need the money himself. He had, he had quite enough. Um, but Vinu did. It was really for her benefit that she was fighting because she was going to ultimately inherit uh, from his estate when he passed away. It was not in her father's interests, uh, but it was very much in hers. Um, the court considered uh, the question of conflicts of interests um, and it should of course be noted 21.43. Um, if you have an interest adverse uh, to the party in question, that is an absolute bar to acting as their litigation friend. So in Nottingshire County Council and, and Bottomley, uh, the applicant uh, who wanted to act as a litigation friend uh, for a child a, in a claim against the council was herself an employee of the council. That was a clear conflict. Um, and, and not only that, but justice needed to be seen to be done and she could not act as a litigation friend. Um, but a distinction needs to be drawn between those who have an adverse interest and those who stand to gain uh, under uh, successful litigation uh, that they wish to act uh, on behalf of, of the party. The court in Hinduja said impartiality is not required. The litigation friend may, must be able to act in the protected party's best interests and properly weigh out relevant factors in making decisions on that party's behalf. That doesn't mean that only an independent outsider with no personal interest in the outcome is qualified uh, to act. The requirement is that they're, act act fair, they're able to act fairly and competently. Um, and that is so if the court is satisfied that they have the necessary skill, ability and uh, experience. The court will, does not need to and will not uh, undertake an, an extended inquiry 
as to uh, the what the one wannabe uh, litigation friend as to whether they have some ulterior motives or whether they stand to gain uh, themselves. Uh, that is it from me on litigation friends and I will hand over uh, to Oliver. Thank you very much, uh, Joss. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, today about the very snappily titled Federal Applications versus Derivative uh, Claims. Um, I tried to find a, a snappier title, but rather failed. But uh, I think in, in hindsight, it's um, some things you need to know about Federal Applications within 15 minutes will do. We're going to be looking at three things um, in this talk. The first is just a recap of the Beto principle and why it matters. Uh, the second is looking at two recent decisions. I've just called them modern revisionism, um, but they illustrate the uh, difficulty that now arises in how best uh, for either beneficiaries or personal representatives to consider their positions dealing with uh, claims involving estates. And finally, we're going to be looking at, um, in light of those authorities, what should uh, personal representatives and beneficiaries do now if they want to prosecute or investigate um, a claim involving an estate. Um, that said, the, the genesis of this talk is the decision of Lyons and Wilcox for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, it's a decision of um, His Honour Judge Paul Matthews up here in Bristol. So if you are uh, a solicitor um, working in the area and you are likely to make a better application, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be made in Bristol and be before um, His Honour Judge Paul Matthews. So it's always helpful to have regard to the way in which he uh, approaches things uh, by his uh, past reported authority. Um, and the second thing is uh, to declare a, an interest insofar as Lines and Wilcox was one of my cases, um, which I lost. And um, in the circumstances seems to have caused a bit of confusion about what we do now. So in many ways, this is an apology tour uh, trying to explain uh, how we deal with uh, better applications now. If there's one thing I would like you to take away from this talk, it's this, that under uh, the decision in Lyons and Wilcox, there does appear to be alternative ways in which claims involving an estate and primarily by an estate against a third party who is also a beneficiary should be handled beyond simply that it is a matter for the executors. And we'll come to that in due course. So first, we'll just uh, do a brief recap of the Bedo principle. Now, there is, um, at least as far as I'm concerned, a famous line that um, in order to appoint an executor, you should appoint your worst enemy to be your executor because it can be a pretty unforgiving and relentless task, although a quick search on Google doesn't tell me where that quote comes from. Um, what, why is that? Well, ex executives, of course, have, have duties and responsibilities to uh, bringing in an estate, preserve its values and administer it properly for the benefit of all the beneficiaries. Um, more than that, executives are not always beneficiaries. So a question may arise as to why on earth it is that I am doing this when I'm not even benefiting from it. Now, the answer to that may be, well, you're going to be paid to do it. But the starting point of common law is that uh, an executor isn't going to be paid remuneration, although they will be entitled to their expenses um, from the estate. Of course, that can be adjusted by a specific uh, term in the will. So when are executives able to reclaim their costs from the estate? They're able to do so under their uh, indemnity of common law or if there are proceedings under the principle under Rule 46.3 of the Civil Procedure Rules, um, which says that uh, where an executor is joined to proceedings in their capacity as such, then they are entitled to an indemnity for their costs from the estate so long as they are properly incurred. Similarly, the indemnity of common law is limited to what is, is proper and reasonable, um, no more than that. So it is always subject to what is um, properly incurred. Now, the, the basis of a Bedo application is that it comes under the broader supervisory uh, jurisdiction of the court as to the administration of trust, trusts and estates and the conduct of trustees. Um, 
it entitles, it is a specific type of application to the court to, to seek permission for a course of action. And that can be done in a number of ways, but usually involving um, litigation. So a decision whether to prosecute litigation or whether to defend litigation on behalf of the estate. And the reason why it's important is that um, if it is made in advance um, before the outcome uh, is known, then so long as the merits justify it, then and the better application or better order is granted it, then an executor can be uh, satisfied that they are going to be able to recover their costs um, incurred in the litigation from the estate. So there'll be no personal cost to them. Um, it is always advisable to do that in advance because it is very difficult to establish after the event, and particularly in the event that the estate has lost, that an executor has acted reasonably when uh, you have lost and there is a large cost bill uh, that you are seeking to be paid out of the estate, to which the beneficiaries may say, well, why on earth did you take this claim or defend it and take away all my money? So if you make a better application in advance, then you effectively, if successful, get that preemptive cost protection on behalf of an executor. Now, estate claims fall into, it, it is said, three slash four types of disputes. And these were identified uh, by the Court of Appeal uh, back in the mid nineties in the case of Allsop, Wilkinson and Neary. Um, these are the type of things that I suspect we're all familiar with one way or another. Uh, the first is the friendly uh, trust dispute in the context of an estate. I would suggest that is uh, this situation. Uh, dear judge, uh, this will was written on the back of a fag packet. We can't see what clause three says. Please, can you construe it for us? There is also hostile trust uh, disputes. That's usually where there's no dis um, no uncertainty as to the terms of the trust, but uh, perhaps as to the status of the beneficiaries in between them. So that might be judge, my cousin says he's a beneficiary under clause three of the will, but in fact he's not. Please rule in my favour. Then there are beneficiary uh, disputes. These are disputes as between the beneficiaries and the executors. So primarily a, a claim in Devastavit or, or something like that. Um, judge, please hold the executor to account because they have run off with all the money. And finally, there are third party disputes. So that is a, a situation where the estate is, is one party and there is um, a third party either bringing a claim against the estate or against whom the estate is claiming. Um, often the example uh, is used for a third party dispute, which is relatively straightforward, um, might involve widgets. So the deceased contracted to buy 10 widgets, he hasn't paid for it, and widget maker has come and is suing on uh, the contract and requires the estate to pay for said widgets. But what we are particularly interested in in this talk is the situation where the third party is not a pure third party, but is also someone who is a beneficiary under the estate. And whilst in a commercial context involving uh, trusts, offshore trusts, we can think of, of lots of situations where um, there may be that separation. In practice, you may find that um, estate disputes involving family members and transactions involving family members usually leads to a considerable amount of overlap between the third party and the beneficiary. And that's what we're going to look at um, in particular. Now, the problem with that situation has been identified as the injustice problem insofar as Bedo applications are concerned, and it arises in this way. If the estate has a claim against a third party who also is a beneficiary under the estate, then there is a difficulty in a situation where the court on a Bedo application approves the executor's decision to take action against that uh, beneficiary slash third party and orders the costs to be paid out of the estate, whatever the outcome. And the problem is that if the estate loses, then on the face of it, they're going to be paying the beneficiary slash third parties um, costs and then seeking to recoup those costs, costs from the estate from which the beneficiary is going to be um, meant to be benefiting. So the beneficiary is going to be paying out of his own pocket for a claim that he has um, been successful on. And the courts recognize that that is an injustice. And if it is, if it can be avoided, it should be. 
So there is a line of authority starting from the Court of Appeal decision in Reed Evans from 1986, which focuses on a particular situation. And it is one where all the beneficiaries and the interested parties are adult and have capacity. And the underlying principle, although it is difficult to uh, work in practice, as we will see, is that in those situations, the um, executors should stay neutral. And it is for the beneficiaries between themselves to decide what to do about the claim. In Re Evans, which was involving a proprietary estoppel farming uh, claim, of course, familiar to, I should think, just about everyone here, um, against the estate made by a cousin um, who was also a beneficiary. The decision um, of the Court of Appeal was that no better application, uh, no better order was appropriate um, because the beneficiary should be left to fight it amongst themselves. And then there must be some countervailing considerations of weight before it is right for um, it to be dealt with at the cost of the state. So that authority has been there. It has been relatively um, unknown, if I can put it um, like that, or at least not focused on on, on a regular basis, but it has now um, reappeared in these two recent decisions. The first is the, the case of Lyons and Wilcox, in which I was involved with. Um, this is a situation where there was an independent executor, so an executor who didn't benefit under the will, so a professional solicitor from um, a partner at the firm who, who drafted the will. Um, mother left her estate uh, to uh, her four children, um, all of whom were adult and who, all of whom had capacity. Um, the main um, asset in the estate would have been the family home, but that had been transferred uh, to one of the children and his wife for uh, no consideration some years previously. And that is, I suspect, the kind of scenario with which um, we're all relatively um, familiar and which ordinarily we would expect beneficiaries to say something should be done about this. Well, the executor went off, took advice um, and decided that it would be appropriate to issue a claim, but sought um, a better relief first. Um, but the judge um, concluded that in circumstances where really this was um, for the benefit of, of the beneficiaries, they should be able to fight it amongst themselves. So refused a better application um, and told the executor to stay neutral and um, allow the beneficiaries to fight it amongst themselves. A few months later, up in London, there was the uh, decision, um, a decision of a master in the case of Dylan and Dylan. Um, similar uh, structural facts, uh, three siblings uh, dealing with um, father's estate, all executors, all beneficiaries, all equal beneficiaries, all adult, all with capacity. Again, potential claims for setting aside lifetime transfers of around half a million pounds to one of the child and the wife. And um, precisely the situation where it would be suggested following re Evans and Lyons and Wilcox um, that in fact um, the proper thing to do was for the beneficiaries to fight it amongst themselves and not seek to have recourse um, to the um, estate for funding and yet a better was granted. Um, if you can discern the differences uh, between the two cases that justify a better in one and not the other, then answers on a postcard, please, uh, because I am still um, struggling to identify precisely what it was in Dillon that tipped the balance over in Lines of Wilcox um, where it was uh, refused. So. What should executors do? Well, this used to be a relatively easy situation, didn't it? Because a cause of action in which the uh, deceased had, which might want to be prosecuted, vested in the administrators or the, the executors, and it was for them to decide um, what to do. But the suggestion is now that if we are in a situation uh, where the beneficiaries are all of full age and capacity, and the first thing to do is assess who your beneficiaries are, then in reality, you need to put the onus on them to take up the uh, mantle and lead with these claims. And um, that puts executives, it seems to me, in, in quite a difficult situation because what they want is certainty as to what they need to do. And what they don't want to do is put themselves in a position where they could be accused later of failing to do something, um, I take on a case, um, which the beneficiaries say um, they should have done. So there needs to be a very clear and um, express consideration of what needs to be done and the decision put on the beneficiaries that if there is a situation like this, 
um, that it is clear that uh, it is for the beneficiaries to do it and the executor is not going to take any nonsense saying that they should do it in light of the authority of, of Lyons and Wilcox and, and otherwise. If that doesn't uh, doesn't work, and yet it's still thought uh, that the application or the claim needs to proceed, then, well, the Bedo application and jurisdiction is still there, but it needs to be issued with more careful thought. But perhaps what's more interesting is what to do in the position of a beneficiary. Um, the the take home message from Lines and Wilcox is that there does appear to be a certain status of standing whereby beneficiaries in this situation um, would have standing to bring a claim to bring in on behalf of the estate um, a, a, an asset or a, a, a claim that needs to be prosecuted in these specific um, circumstances. And what Judge Matthew said is in, in these circumstances, the executives need to be joined, but they're just going to be nominal defendants. They're, they're joined to bind the um, state. Um, this seems particularly um, helpful because it otherwise short circuits what we previously understood to be the rules for derivative claims, which is that they required very special circumstances and ordinarily an executive refusing uh, to bring, a, bring in um, a claim. Um, but it is particularly helpful for a lot of the common claims which um, you may be advising um, states or executives on how to deal with. I think of, in particular, uh, setting aside lifetime uh, transactions and financial abuse uh, cases as well. So mismanagement, misappropriation of monies by uh, an attorney or a, a deputy or, or, or something like that. Um, in the circumstances um, suggested by Lyons and Wilcox, it's not no longer necessary to go through the, the palaver of trying to persuade the executive to take the case on. The, uh, the beneficiary can issue the claim in their own name if that is what is appropriate. But if they do so, of course, then they, um, they do so at risk to costs and there is no prospect of them getting their costs out of um, the estate. So it is, um, it is a, a still a slightly um, baffling and difficult case. It provides a level of uncertainty for executives, but perhaps a new avenue by which uh, beneficiaries can grasp um, the nettle. Um, and uh, it may be worth uh, considering if you have an estate um, in these particular circumstances, whether it alters uh, what might need to be done. And with that, thank you for listening. I'll hand over to Michael. Good morning, everybody. I'm just waiting for the slides to appear for me. Which doesn't seem to be happening yet. There we go. Things have worked wonderful. Well, good morning, everybody. As you can see, the slides are now uh, up and running. Uh, we've got slightly under time, um, about 12 minutes, so that, that should be fine. I'll try to get uh, wrapped up in that time. Um, and uh, we, we, of course, need to observe the minute silence if we can at um, 11 o'clock. So let's go through the basics. I'm not going to spend a particularly long time on the basics. Uh, mainly because um, I, I'm rather anticipating everybody's familiar with that. And really the um, point of, of this talk today is to focus on one particular issue, and that's the issue we'll see, the uh, matter of privilege. So the basics are uh, on this slide here. Uh, as we will know, there is um, uh, a beast called a Larkinugus letter. It's become rather a term of art. Uh, and it arises where there's a dispute about the validity of, uh, of a will. And of course, that's a material dispute. It doesn't need to be particularly um, uh, a, a serious dispute, but it's, it's got to be enough to be um, to, to show that, that, that there's something meaningful in it. Um, and simply entering a caveat simply uh, won't do. Uh, 
you're then looking for a scenario where a typically a, a solicitor is going to be a, a will draft and of course he will be a, a material witness and then it's a a case of uh, what is good practice is the starting point and the good practice as we all know is that uh, the solicitor ought to provide a statement surrounding the uh, execution of the will and and the surrounding facts so it's not just the attendance upon the execution of course it's the uh, drafting uh, exercise also the instructions that were taken uh, anything reasonably surrounding the, the the execution that's going to go to the validity or otherwise of the will um, documents ought to be disclosed and uh, it's obviously normally easier to simply uh, hand over the will file uh, and the reasons for uh, this practice is, is obvious uh, it may well save the cost of unnecessary litigation uh, it's uh, clearly in, in the interests uh, of everybody to know at a very early stage whether there's anything in this validity challenge uh, uh, so that it can be dealt with the good news, of course, is that uh, if you are a solicitor will drafter, then uh, you're able to charge a reasonable fee for your time and, of course, the costs of supplying any files. As we know, the. Uh, there is a very much a template. Uh, which has been produced by various sources, including I think the Law Society has one. You'll have one available to you on um, uh, practical law. Uh, they uh, all really go to the same thing. Now, I've produced on this one slide just a few examples. It's not, of course, um, a, a, an exhaustive list, but you'll see the obvious things there that um, the statement really ought to um, go to um, the initial instructions, things such as who introduced uh, the client to you, did you meet them face to face, uh, had you previously acted for them. Obvious things such as signs of confusion or memory loss uh, are something that uh, the author of a Larkin News letter is going to want to know about. Uh, and of course, you may want to tailor it, so uh, it may well be tailored to um, uh, any particular concerns you have about the uh, the testator at the time. Uh, as you will know, these letters typically uh, go on for um, sometimes a page and a half, two pages, but uh, I, I just put those there as a, as a feel for the types of things that um, ought to be included. Now, what this talk is really about is the thorny problem of what I've described as the non-executive, non-party solicitor drafter. So what we're concerned about here is, um, and this is really the key question as far as this talk is concerned, what is the position with uh, a solicitor who does not take a grant and is therefore not a, an executor and of course won't be a party to any probate action? Now, that raises the issue of privilege. Uh, it's um, quite clear that a testator giving instructions to a solicitor um, will enjoy legal advice privilege. Uh, and it's clear and uncontentious that once he's died, uh, that passes to his successors in title. So the privilege is enjoyed uh, in the first instance by the executors. That means that it's the executive's privilege to waive. Now, the difficulty about Larkin Nugas, I think, is it's not clear at all whether um, Larkin Nugas unsettles that position. And by that, I mean that uh, it's not clear whether uh, Larkin Nugas is simply uh, a case where uh, an executive enjoying privilege is expected to waive it uh, in respect of the um, uh, the will drafting or whether it goes further and, and effectively establishes that there's no privilege uh, assertable in the first place. Um, two very different things, of course. So the chronology or the history of this, the development in this area really is summarised on this slide, uh, which, uh, as you will see, um, starts with an opinion from the from the uh, 
uh, from the person there, Sir Edward Mill near Holland QC. That was around at about uh, 1965. Uh, the Law Society commissioned that opinion, turned it into guidance, which was published in the Law Society Gazette. And that it is that guidance that was taken into account in Larkinugas. Um, shortly after Larkinugas was another, another case, Buckingham and Dickinson. Now Buckingham and, uh, and Dickinson um, appears or possibly to um, ex extend the, um, the principle in Larkinugas. We'll come back to that. And that's picked up in the latest Law Society guidance, which I've uh, identified there for you, dated the uh, 20th of December uh, last year. So the first thing to look at is what was the, the initial guidance given uh, at, at, in, to, in, in the Law Society guidance and which was taken into account in Larkin Ugas. And I've set it out uh, for you there. The, the uh, second paragraph is really the, the place to start where it says privilege cannot be claimed by one person claiming under a deceased testator's will as against another person having a similar claim in respect of matters communicated by the deceased to his solicitor during his lifetime. Well, that on its face would seem to uh, indicate that uh, whenever the uh, uh, solicitor is uh, will drafter is a material witness and there's a will challenge that uh, disclosure and a, a statement ought to be provided. And you'll see it continues accordingly where a serious dispute arises as to the validity of a will and the solicitor's knowledge makes him a material witness, he should make available a statement of his evidence regarding the execution of the will and the circumstances surrounding it to anyone concerned in the proving or challenging of the will. Well, the, the highlighting is mine or the underlining is, is mine, but that does seem to be a, in, in the guidance at least, um, a pretty um, definitive um, statement. But the question of course becomes, what does taken into account mean? Now in, in Larkin Ugas, the, um, the, uh, guidance was simply stated. There was no um, real consideration of it as such. It was stated and identified it is good practice. So that raises the question um, of what was the ratio of Larkin uh, and Ugas? Because in Larkin and Ugas, the world drafter uh, was an executor. So it would seem that uh, if you look at it on that level, that uh, it was only sought to apply in the case of an executor and there was no need, of course, for the court to go further and consider the wider application of privilege. In fact, privilege um, wasn't expressly discussed by the court at all. But if we turn to the facts of Larkin Ugas, uh, what we had was a will where the testator made uh, a gift of a house to Mr and Mr Mrs. Lucas, and then you had pecuniary legacies to Nugas, who was the uh, niece of the deceased, and 14 other people with the residue to charity. <clears throat> now, Lark was the solicitor will drafter and, and, and the, it became the ex executor, uh, and there was a defence and counterclaim by Nugas in two respects. The first was uh, that there was want of knowledge and approval, of course, of the will in general, and secondly, that there was undue influence by the legatees of the house. Well, uh, the counterclaim was discontinued and it became a question of, of deciding uh, where the costs ought to fall. And the costs um, in respect of knowledge and approval um, were held to fall upon Mr Lark. I've just been given a sign to say that we've got one minute until the uh, one minute silence. So uh, with that in mind, I think I'll pause there. In fact, it's a two minute silence, I understand. So I'll pause there and I'll hand. Uh, in, in fact, I'll, I won't hand back to Beth. I'll just I'll go out on a limb and call the two minute silence myself. I 
I think perhaps we'll uh, start it now. That's two minutes. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so to continue, uh, in Dark and Nugas, the uh, it was quite clear that the court was unimpressed that um, uh, Mr. Lark took no, made no real attempt to um, to reassure uh, Miss Nugas. Um, but what's not clear is whether or not this obligation to reassure her was. Uh, in his capacity as the will drafter, in, in his capacity as the executor, and of course, a, a potential party uh, to proceedings. Um, that wasn't dis discussed in the case because uh, it, it simply wasn't an issue. Uh, but this is what uh, Lord Justice Brandon said, when there's litigation about a will, every effort should be made by executors to avoid costly litigation give full and frank information to those who might have an interest in attacking the will. I do not think the matter turns solely on the recommendation of the Law Society. So it, it would seem to be that the court clearly had its mind um, on, um, on the obligations of executives. And of course, if Mr. Lark was an executor um, enjoying the privilege uh, and was material witnessed by um, means of his, him drafting the will, uh, it was his privilege to to waive. You know, arguably the, uh, the the ratio is that an executor with privilege to waive ought to do so, um, and, and there's nothing more to it than that. Perhaps um, the law society certainly aren't clear. Um, quite rightly, they they say there's a divergence of opinion, uh, and the position is not yet clear. And they rely upon the case of Buckingham and Dickinson. Well, it said in the, the latest guidance that that was a case of a, a solicitor who was not an executor being expected to disclose. Well, uh, I've read Buckingham and Dickinson. It's quite a difficult case to, to find. Uh, the odd thing about it is that uh, in that case, Dickinson who was the will drafter, was also a party. In fact, he was the first defendant. So it's not quite clear if he was only a witness rather than uh, an executive, why he became a party. And the case doesn't particularly help because it simply says that um, the executives are two, two of the partners of a firm of solicitors without naming them. So 
Firstly, it's not entirely clear that Dickinson wasn't a, um, an executive. Um, in any event, he was a, he was a party. Um, but the, the court in that case, um, although it considered making uh, an adverse cost order against him for failing to um, go far enough in providing uh, information and, and disclosing, it, it decided not to do so on the particular facts. But the, um, the point is it's difficult to see I think uh, uh, Buckingham and Dickinson as clearly at least extending uh, the, the ratio of Lark. Um, so the guidance that you're left with is this from the Law Society. It says if you are named as an executor in the will, uh, quite rightly pointing out as in Lark and Ugas, you should provide the requested statement and relevant documents so long as no other person has a sustainable claim to legal privilege uh, in the material. So, of course, somebody else could have a claim to uh, material. For instance, there could have been joint instructions, there could have been a mutual will, um, for instance. Uh, but assuming not, um, the guidance seems to be uh, indicating that it's your privilege to waive and you ought to do so. That, that's certainly the reading I take from it. Um, the thornier question, of course, if you're not the named executor, or where consent's not been provided, uh, you must satisfy yourself at least there is a, a serious dispute. Well, fine, that, that will always be the case about the validity of the will beyond the mere entering of a caveat and that no issue of privilege arises. So it clearly pushes the onus back upon um, back upon solicitors to establish whether there is any privilege and clearly comes down on the cautious side. Uh, and finally, you might indicate you were prepared to make a statement and provide relevant documents, uh, but that you first require confirmation that neither the named executor nor any other person make a claim to privilege in the material and that they consent to your disclosure. Subject to obtaining such consent, you should provide the statement and document. So again, um, it's concerned uh, with consent. So as I say, the Law Society position seems to be very cautious, understandably so. Uh, so really the question come, becomes, um, what should you do? Well, as I think I've indicated, I, I, I find it difficult to see that Lark and Nugas or Buckingham and, uh, and Dickinson uh, provide any wider authority to say that there's no assertable privilege. I think the cautious and um, sensible approach has got to be to assume that there, there is privilege and that it's not simply a case of um, a, a will drafter uh, solicitor just being able to simply provide a, a response to a Lark and Yuga statement without any concerns of privilege. You, you, you really do need to bottom it out. And I suppose if you look at it <clears throat> pragmatically, what are the risks of refusing to provide disclosure and, and a statement. Well, um, if we look at Rule um, 31.16, um, pre-action disclosure, that's not going to be applicable because, of course, a, a will drafter who's not an executor and not going to be taking a grant and not going to be a party to the action um, isn't going to be subject to and can't be subject to uh, an application of a pre-action disclosure because that only applies to uh, proposed or potential um, parties. Um, what about um, disclosure and I suppose inspection during the course of proceedings once they're on foot? Well, <clears throat> I suppose so, a third party um, application could be made, but in, in those those circumstances, of course, the costs normally fall upon the, the applicant in any event. And uh, if you, you simply refused to provide the information because you haven't been given the appropriate consent by an, an executor, then it's difficult to see how uh, the court would be minded to change, for that reason alone, the, uh, the normal cost rule. Uh, there's also the possibility of uh, an action under section 122 of the Senior Courts Act for a subpoena. And so that's a subpoena uh, which will demand uh, the or any, any person with knowledge of testamentary documents to attend court and be examined. Uh, that could be proposed, but in that case, uh, the, the, the obvious answer is yes, I'm prepared to attend as long as the court um, 
authorizes me to um, uh, and de declares that de that uh, there's no privilege. Um, so that comes back to the same point, I suppose, that it's just very difficult to see how um, you could be condemned in costs if you take the position that the Law Society has um, has recommended, even even if it proves later to be overly cautious uh, and that there is no privilege if that ever gets decided. Um, <clears throat> final thought is perhaps the answer really lies here with the executors. The executors are, are of course going to be a party to any probate action. If it's their consent to give and and to uh, and they're privileged to waive and they decide not to give that consent and that's just and that's deemed to be uh, unreasonable uh, by the court in the later um, proceedings then the obvious answer and, and submission ought to be that uh, they be the ones to to bear the costs not the um, not the witness because the bottom line is of course that uh, the uh, solicitor will drafter who's not an executive is simply a, a witness and, and nothing more than that. So that concludes um, this final talk. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm sorry we've gone over slightly. Um, I will now hand you back to Beth and I think we need to look at Q&A. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, the Q&A box is getting quite full with questions to you, Michael, on the last Larkin Nugas um, uh, talk. And I think at the practical end, as solicitors, we do find some difficulty dealing with uh, other solicitors who try to charge not only uh, for just the preparation of the statement, but also for all of their time, uh, recalling the will file, reviewing it, poring over it. And um, I've got a question here from Robert Hill at Threes, and he's saying, what are your views? Can solicitors charge for all of that time in recalling the will file, reviewing the will, drafting a statement, talking to the uh, private client team? Uh, what do you think the SRA position is on that, Michael? There we go. Can you can you hear me now? So I think it automatically muted when I handed back control. Um, well, I, I can tell you that the Law Society guidance makes clear that um, and cross refers to the SRA um, guidance as well, that makes it clear that it's possible to charge a reasonable fee. Of course, it comes down to um, what is a, a reasonable fee. So as always, it's going to be um, as a matter of professional conduct, it's going to be a, a case of showing that, um, that that what you're asking for is reasonable. So, but in principle, it seems to be very well established and expected that uh, solicitors will charge a reasonable fee for their time. And I think you should do so. But um, you always get this issue, don't you, with you know, uh, whether it be disclosure or photocopying, you can always have that argument about whether the fees are reasonable. So I, I think it's just a case of, uh, of taking a, a sensible view. And the only thing I would add to that is if you are the requester of the Larkin Nugas letter, you can steal a march slightly in your letter and say, uh, we will of course permit your reasonable charges for considering the will file and writing the letter, and trying to narrow it down in your initial correspondence so that then they don't go and try and drag in all the other little bits and bobs um, that Robert has, has set out in his message. Um, it may not work. You may still have a fight on your hands about, you know, what is and isn't considered reasonable. But at, at least I would, would certainly try and try and minimise it as best you can at the outset and, and fire a shot across the bows. Yes, I think so. But um, I mean, it's 
I mean, the preparation of the, I mean, there's no set rule, is there, but the preparation of the mark in this looking at Robert's question there, the, the preparation of the letter must um, include reviewing the will file, be, file because if you look at what was um, said in, in Lark and Ugas, it's not just very clear, it's not just the execution itself, it's it's the, the relevant um, facts surrounding it, surrounding it. So, I mean, you're going to be asking the question in the Larkin Ugas request, you know, when did you first meet the the client? Well, you know, what do the attendance notes say? Did the did the client, did the testator understand the extent of their estate and the people who ought to share in their, their bounty? And it's very difficult to think how you can give a meaningful Larkin Ugas request without and statement without going through all of that information. Um. The One of the um, practical problems I think from uh, solicitors and I'm sure many of my fellow practitioners will be out there sitting there thinking the same is, is it worth the battle with your compliance team? I mean because who are you raising the bill to? This unknown person who is not a client, you haven't done due diligence on them um, and will we want, will our compliance and accounts team want money 500 pounds or whatever coming into the client account um, when we haven't got a client. So I must admit, from my own personal view, I, I never bother charging for Mark and Nugus responses because it's more hassle with compliance and accounts than I feel it's worth. Um, I'd love it if you were all here and I could uh, have a show of hands, um, but feel free to chip in on the chat or the q and I don't know, um, Daniel or uh, Oliver or Michael or Ross, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, Mark, my understanding's always been that um, solicitors just want to get the request in and out as quickly as possible and forget about it. That's always been my impression. Um, and, and it's not seen as a not seen as a way to make money. Uh, I've not really come across a solicitor who sees it as a, as a genuine profit. Exactly. Yeah, I, and, and I would say that it, it seems to be the golden rule with Larkin users that is that you get them out as quickly as possible because it, the longer you delay, the overactive imagination of the other side as to what you're cooking up uh, will continue. So the last thing you want is a thing that is, is holding up being compliance about what you're going to charge them for this letter or, or so on. Yeah. Um, you're simply, it, it can end up being the least of your worries. So my impression is that most solicitors don't bother to charge. But again, that does seem to be sort of a, a general impression rather than based on any uh, detailed evidence. OK, so Larkin Nugas says if you're requesting, try and limit it in your letter and say, we'll pay your reasonable charges, not more than X. And um, if you're doing them, just be cautious if you are charging and make sure you do a quick turnaround seems to be the advice from the floor there. Um, have we got any other questions from the audience? I know you're all out there, I can't see you, but I know you must have many questions. I'm quite fascinated about the uh, Bedo. I say fascinated, perhaps also a little bit terrified. Um, has anybody got any other questions they want to ask? Hannah, can you see any more questions coming in there? Daniel, have you got have you got one there? I think I can see some questions about caveats um, from Michael uh, and from Anonymous. Um, the first one is a practical question. Can an affidavit of non-appearance be filed online? Um, my understanding is that although the caveat can be um, entered online, the affidavit of non-appearance and indeed the appearance itself both have to be filed either by post or in person. Um, I've got another question here about um, how long do I recommend a party allows for investigations <clears throat> excuse me, before putting in a warning to a caveat, particularly if there's no visibility of ongoing investigations. Uh, and there's a further question along similar lines uh, and also in the circumstances where there are mounting uh, debts, uh, mounting estate liabilities, which are starting to increase due to non-payment, when should a limited grant be applied for? Well, I think um, it's really important to open, keep open the lines of communication with the caveator here and um, to ask them you know, how long, how long do you think you need to investigate your claim? Um, if it's a claim for lack of capacity, for example, it may just be uh, the case that they need to see the medical records, which um, hopefully shouldn't take, take too long. 
Um, and once they've had that time or they've had a, a, a fair amount of time, uh, a request could be made to them to consider withdrawing the caveat uh, and prevent the need for you to enter a warning at all, because the last thing you want to do is jump the gun, enter a warning and land yourself with an appearance which uh, was could have been avoided. Um, so perhaps invite them to withdraw the caveat or alternatively to, to send you a letter before claim uh, so that you can actually uh, assess uh, the claim being made. And then um, you can always set a set a deadline for that. Say, please withdraw your caveat or provide a letter before claim by X date. Otherwise, we will be issuing a warning. Uh, and at least then you put them on notice that that's coming uh, and you've taken uh, the steps that you can uh, to prevent an unnecessary appearance being entered. Um, as to the application for a limited grant, if you've got mounting liabilities, uh, uh, happening in the background, then uh, you may also want to try and get the other side of the caveators consent to the limited grant because clearly it's in everyone's interest to protect the estate uh, and to preserve it. Uh, so you could hope to put to, to obtain that consent to the limit for a limited grant and then you can make an application uh, and hopefully it can be dealt with on the papers and prevent uh, further costs of a hearing. If there's no consent to a limited grant, then uh, it's a bit of a judgment call really. You've got to weigh up how much uh, liabilities are, are mounting, how much they're increasing, what's the cost of the application going to be if there needs to be a hearing. If there's no consent to who should take the limited grant, then the court might want to consider appointing an, uh, an independent professional uh, to, to, to take that grant and that will um, cause further costs. And then how much more time do you think the caveator needs to investigate their claim? So there's a number of factors you want to weigh up uh, and it may well be worth uh, obtaining a limited grant, especially if you can get the other side's consent. Um, but if not, it can be a, a bit of a, a trickier judgment call. Thank you, Daniel. Oliver, I don't know if you just saw that there was a question there. Um, perhaps I could prevail upon you to read that out for the audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. We'll see if. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the question is twofold is, is this. Um, would an application under um, a better application be necessary where the potential litigation is small claims, so the cost consequences likely to be limited? Um, it, in my view, almost certainly not. Um, it would be the cost of a, a better application uh, would be disproportionate in, in those circumstances and practice. It's quite difficult to do a, a properly uh, prepared better application uh, in compliance with uh, the requirements in part 64 and otherwise for really anything less than, than four or five thousand uh, pounds plus plus that and you know that that's going to be um, you know halfway to your small claims limit um, and even then there aren't uh, cost consequences unless you're acting unreasonably um, in those circumstances it depends on what you've done with the widgets really um, and the second question is um, can we assume that where beneficiaries are under 18 uh, better application is the best course of action uh, yes you can um, the principles in in lines of Wilcox and Rhea Evans only apply to adults of capacity so if you've got a minor or if you've got someone who lacks capacity or even if they even if you, you think they uh, lack capacity and you haven't undertaken all the uh, investigations and followed the steps that Joss was talking about earlier, um, then yes, um, a, a better application would still be um, appropriate. Um, one, one thing that um, I, I didn't mention in the talk but could have, I suppose, is that it's always open to executives to get indemnities from beneficiaries who are um, able to directly, um, who are able to, to give them. That's partly a, a matter of uh, capacity and it's partly a matter of whether or not they're good for the money as well. Um, but um, that wouldn't solve your problem with minors um, or those lacking capacity. Either. Thank you, Oliver. Have we got any more questions from the audience? I can't believe the uh, number of people out there uh, that, that you must have some questions, I feel. We'd love to be offering you coffee and macaroons and talking um, uh, and having the barristers mingle with you. Um, but I'm afraid in this virtual world, this is um, your opportunity now. If you have anything else, please do put it through. No, I don't think, Emily, can you see anything else coming through? I think that's a, that's a zero from the audience. Okay, well, in that case, um, I think it's time to wrap up. 
Thank you so much for uh, your participation and a big shout out in particular to those of you who did ask questions. Uh, it makes this uh, session much more interactive for Michael, Oliver, Joss and Daniel that have kindly given up their time uh, to uh, help uh, guide us on these tricky um, issues. Litigation friends and Beddo orders in particular, some important updates there. So uh, just that's it. Thank you so much. And there are series three and four in these webinar series coming out by St John's. So please do look out for those and um, sign up for those as well. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of the Wednesday. Bye.